What a great day. Uh, truly grateful to, to be here. I'm grateful that each and every one of you guys are here this morning. Um, we serve an awesome God. He's a loving God, and he's, this is the day that he has made. Uh, he's made each and every day, but uh, this day specifically, we all woke up and we're here this morning, and we've chosen to, to be here, uh, to, to serve God, to worship him, and, and honor him, and give him praises, and uh, again, I'm truly grateful to see each and every one of you guys here this morning. This November will mark 16 years since uh, a little baby by the name of Hermias Leonardo Esteban was brought into this world. Leonardo's story is, is really an interesting one. In fact, he was uh, just one baby among uh, many brothers and sisters. Uh, in fact, the difference, though, between him and his brothers and sisters is that uh, Leonardo was uh, given to uh, an orphanage. He was put up for adoption by his mother. His mother felt that, as if she could not take care of him, and so uh, in so doing, she, she gave him up to an orphanage. And so Leonardo was, uh, again, just a small infant put into this orphanage. In fact, the orphanage uh, home was the Eagle's Nest in Guatemala City, Guatemala. And this is one of the, the larger uh, orphanages in Guatemala City. And so Leonardo was, uh, again, just one uh, orphan among um, hundreds and hundreds of orphans that have come through uh, that orphanage throughout the years. And Leonardo's story, uh, again, began there in that orphanage home. But, however, uh, he was... He was a, a lucky child. Again, I mentioned that uh, you know we, we can look at it and think, well, he was given to this uh, to this uh, adoption place, um, you know, different from his brothers and sisters. However, his brothers and sisters uh, were sold to a banana plantation, uh, pretty much as indentured servants. And so, in a sense, again, Leonardo uh, was the lucky one. Um, he was given to this adoption agency, and in fact, uh, he ended up being adopted by a, an American family um, from the Midwest and the United States, uh, and uh, brought to that country, and has spent almost the last 16 years there in the United States, uh, being loved by this family, and being exposed to all the luxuries and all of the... Um, Oh, first world, so to speak, uh, benefits, if you want to call them that. Um, so instead of being sold into a banana plantation as, as an indentured servant like the rest of his brothers and sisters, uh, Leonardo uh, was again adopted by an American family and uh, lived the, the last almost 16 years in the United States. And this family has, has loved him and they have uh, taken care of him for the last 16 years and treated them as their own. Now, I don't know about you, but I personally was not adopted. I grew up in a uh, you know, normal, I don't want to say normal, but I grew up in a family where I was uh, biological, you know, with my biological parents, and so I was not adopted. And if you have not been adopted, or if you've not adopted a child yourself, then maybe you're just not uh, as familiar uh, with, with adoption and what it's like to, to be adopted. However, um, again, Leonardo's story is, is not necessarily unique in the fact that he was given to, uh, to an orphanage home. Um, there are some approximated 200 million orphans in the world today. Approximately 200 million orphans in our world today. Uh, there's, uh, again, another estimate is that there are uh, 5,760 new orphans brought into the world every single day uh, that goes by. In connection with this, uh, these, these orphans, many of them, there are thousands every year that uh, they call it aging out, meaning they, uh, they turn 18 and they, the orphan home uh, can no longer keep them, and so they, uh, they age out of uh, the, the adoption process, and thus they go into the world uh, really having no family, um, not much of an identity, and so they're really robbed of uh, this kinship and this, this familyhood. Again, if you haven't been adopted, then maybe you're not, uh, you can't really relate to that. And uh, I, I personally can't myself. I, I, like I said, I wasn't adopted. However, spiritually speaking, Scripture tells us that we 
We're all orphans. In the passage uh, that Sean just read so well ago, a moment, uh, a moment ago, uh, it speaks about how we, uh, we were all um, orphans and how God has adopted us as sons through Jesus Christ. In fact, he says that it was before the foundation of the world uh, that God predetermined us as uh, into adoption as sons through Jesus Christ into himself. And this passage that we are going to look at, so if you haven't already opened your Bibles this morning, go ahead and open up to Ephesians chapter 1. That's where we're going to spend our time here this morning. And we're going to look at uh, really this, this concept that God has adopted us and really what it, what it means, uh, what's connected to it, and really the, the love that God has shown mankind in, in his offer of adoption as sons. And the passage that saw Sean read is really, um, it's really one long sentence in the original language. In fact, it's called a, uh, a doxology, meaning it's, it's a word of praise. Um, it's one, again, one long sentence. Uh, there's no, uh, it's just one long run on uh, praise that Paul is giving to God uh, and speaking about God and Christ and what he's done. And uh, really for us, the, the message here for us is that uh, in verse 3, it speaks about how every spiritual blessing uh, has been provided in Christ. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places has come in Christ. And again, uh, God chose us as his children to be adopted as his children, uh, to which we were once orphans uh, in Christ. And it's through him, through Christ, that this adoption takes place. And so, connected with this adoption, there are, uh, there's really four actions that God has taken that are connected with this adoption that, that we're going to look at. So again, there, there's four actions uh, that God has taken, but, but as we look at these four actions that God has taken regarding our adoption as, as His children, uh, there's this, this concept that, that I want us to, uh, to remember, and that is that God's eternal blessings can only be obtained by those who are in Christ. Again, God's eternal blessings can only be obtained by those who are in Christ. The first action that God has taken regarding our addiction and connected to uh, this adoption is that we have been redeemed. God has redeemed us. Look at verse 7. It says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He made abundant toward us, in all wisdom and insight. So the first action that God has taken is that He has redeemed us. And it says that it was through His blood. This idea of redemption, again, we always have to remember, uh, you know, who wrote, uh, who, who's doing the writing, who is it written to, um, you know, what, what was the time, the setting, uh, the, the context, the culture, so on and so forth. And this, uh, this was written to the Ephesians, who primarily was, would have been a Gentile church. And this was in the Greek, the Greco-Roman world. And this concept of redemption is something that uh, they would have been very familiar with. In fact, during this time, uh, redemption was more, more connected to, uh, in, in the Greek world, of uh, buying back a slave. Uh, one, one particular uh, instance of this is when there would be a, a battle. Uh, a battle would take place between two armies, and one side would lose, obviously, and one side would be the victor, and then the losing side would be taken into slavery, and what could happen is if a certain person was lucky enough that they could be bought back or redeemed with a certain price, uh, and basically being bought out of that slavery. So they were redeemed uh, from that slavery. And that's the concept that, that Paul is really expressing here. He says that we have been redeemed through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. So we have been redeemed from the forgiveness of our trespasses. We've been redeemed from our trespasses. If we look at uh, verse 1 and 2 of chapter 2, Paul says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. He says, you are dead in your trespasses and in your sins. God has redeemed us from this death that our sin has caused us. He has redeemed us through his blood. In verse 13 of chapter 2, uh, Paul speaks, he says, that we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 
Meaning we've been brought near to God by the blood of Christ. Uh, we know that uh, other places in Scripture talks about how without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This goes back to the Old Covenant. Uh, we can read about it in Leviticus uh, how blood had to be shed in order for there to be atonement for sin. And so the same concept is here that speaks about how, again, we have been redeemed through the blood of Christ from the forgiveness of our trespasses. In those first two verses of chapter 2, I find it interesting where, he, again, he says, we were dead in our trespasses. However, he says, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world and according to the prince of the power of the air. That, that means Satan. So I find it's a, it's a stark contrast from where he says that, and really in this, that doxology that, uh, that Sean read earlier, where four times in those 11 verses... Uh, Paul mentions whether eating uh, according to the riches of his grace or according to his good pleasure or according to uh, really according to God and according to God's plan. So God's redemption, God's adoption for us was according to his plan. But our sins, the death that our sins caused and, the, and how we walked in those sins, we lived in those sins, that wasn't according to God. That wasn't according to his will. That was according to the course of this world. That was according to the prince of the power of the air. That was according to Satan. That was not according to, to what God wanted. And again, he says that uh, God's, uh, according to the riches of God's grace, which he made abundant toward us in all wisdom and insight. You know, one of the songs that, uh, that, we, that we just sung earlier was, you know, I, I love the Lord for he is so good to me. What a... What an amazing concept that God is so good to us. He loves us so much that he wanted us to be his children, that he, he made abundant toward us. He lavished on us this grace of his, that we did not deserve this. This grace uh, there is nothing that, that, that we deserve. We were dead, and God made it abundant toward us. So again, the first action that we have taken that God took regarding our, our adoption is that he redeemed us. But it's important that we notice, again, he says, where that redemption comes from. It's, it's in Christ. It's in Him or in whom. So again, that shows us that God's eternal blessings can only be obtained by those who are in Christ. There's also a second action, though, that, that God take, that took, he took regarding and connected to our adoption as His children. And that comes in verse 9. And that second action that He took was that He made known to us the mystery of his will. Verse 9 says, He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in him, into the management of the fullness of the times, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. So God made known to us the mystery of his will. Our English understanding of this, this word mystery uh, doesn't really do justice to, 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 the, to the meaning uh, of the New Testament word here. Uh, when, I, when I hear mystery, what I think about is something that really is uh, it's unexplainable. You know, it's, uh, uh, I don't know if they've got a show here in Australia, but, but in the U.S. they've got a show called Unsolved Mysteries. Where there's this, whether it's about ghosts or aliens or whatever it may be, or just maybe some, some crime, but it's an unsolved Mystery. So to, to me, uh, when I hear that word, and, and I think our understanding of that in the English language is that it's something that can't really be understood. It, we, we can't know it. Um, it's something that is just beyond our, our understanding. It's something that will never be able to be explained. That's not the way that, that it's used here. And that's really not the way that, that Paul uses it in his writings. Uh, Paul, he gives an explanation of it uh, in chapters 2 and in chapters 3. Uh, this, this mystery that he speaks about, we, we read about um, in, in chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, where he speaks about uh, how, how the, the dividing wall was broken down and, and the barrier by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, uh, which is the law of commandments and ordinances, uh, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Chapter 3, uh, verses 3 through 6, uh, Paul says that by revelation there is made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, 
as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. So that's the concept of the mystery that Paul is speaking about. It's something that was once not known by man. God had not revealed it to man, but now it has been revealed. And this mystery in verse 6, he tells us what that is. And that is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So the Gentiles are fellow heirs among with the Jews. So the Jews were God's chosen people in the beginning uh, with his covenant. However, now the Gentiles are part of, of that, that inheritance, that promise um, that he speaks about. Uh, the Abrahamic promise. And that's the mystery that, that God has now made known to us. Uh, every one of us in this room is a Gentile. Uh, you know, none of us uh, were uh, you know, part of the ancient Israelites. So we're all Gentiles. God has made known to us the mystery of his will. That the Gentiles are our fellow heirs uh, according to, uh, to his good pleasure that he speaks about in verse 9. Which God purposed, again, in Christ. The fullness of the times. The summing up of all things in Christ. All things have been summed up in Christ. That we, this mystery, that as Gentiles, we are fellow heirs. This is the summing up of, of all things. All things that God had done in the past has been leading up to this point. Things in the heavens and things on the earth. Again, going back to the beginning of, of verses 3 and 4, this was God's plan from the beginning of time. So before the foundation of the world, before... God made the world. He predetermined us into adoption. Gentiles, Jews, all alike. This was according to God's plan. And again, though, we have to really pay attention and notice, though, that it says that it's in Christ and in Him. Which shows us one more time that God's eternal blessings can only be attained by those who are in Christ. The third action that God has taken connected with our adoption as sons is that he has given us an inheritance. God has given us an inheritance. Verse 11, he says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predetermined according to his purpose, who works all things after the intention of his will. To the end that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, would be to the praise of his glory. NAS says we have obtained an inheritance. The, the, the verb that's used there is, is uh, it's a verb that really signifies that it's something that we cannot do on our own. It's something that has to be done for us. And so, really, God has given us this inheritance. It's not something that we've earned or obtained or, or discovered on our own. Again, it's something that God has given to us. Uh, we have obtained this inheritance, having been predetermined, again, according to his purpose, not according to ours, but according to God's purpose, who works all things after the intention of his will. There's two brothers from Budapest, Hungary. Their names are Zolt and Giza Pilati. These brothers grew up in, in humble means. Uh, they, they didn't have much uh, when, when they were children. And in fact, by the time that they, they actually uh, became adults, uh, their circumstances really were so much that they, they ended up living in a cave. They, they were homeless. Uh, they had uh, no shelter. They had no home. They had really no money. In fact, in order to feed themselves, they had to go around Budapest and scrounge up scrap metal uh, really to sell for pennies. Literally to be able to have food to eat. Uh, again, so these brothers, you know, they, they had no hope. Uh, they thought that they would die, uh, you know, really penniless, um, trying to find food to eat every day, day after day. However, one day there were some, some social workers that came and they found these brothers. Uh, these, these homeless social workers had actually been contacted by uh, a, a lawyer from Germany who was connected to uh, these, these brothers' uh, family members. In fact, these brothers had had uh, a grandmother who had uh, recently passed away in Germany, and according to German law, uh, that there is, by, by, again, by law, the direct descendants were automatically entitled to a part of the inheritance. And so, after much uh, you know, research and maybe blood tests and so on and so forth, 
uh, it was discovered and really uh, determined that these the, the Pallotti brothers were in fact uh, the the closest living direct descendants of this grandmother, and so they inherited. Uh, really, they were the ones who were again uh, directly uh, intended to their her estate. They ended up inheriting the equivalent of 5.4 billion U.S. dollars. I don't know what that is in Aussie dollars, but that's a lot of money. Um, 5.4 billion uh, U.S. dollars, and they have now moved to the United States and are living there with their sister. So they went from homeless, living in a cave, to scrounging up scrap metal to sell for pennies to feed themselves, to now uh, inheriting 5.4 billion dollars. I don't know about you, but I personally probably, I don't think I would want that amount of money. I think, uh, you know, more money, more problems. Um, however, none of us may ever inherit that amount of money. However, God has given us an inheritance that is far more valuable than any monetary amount, any dollar amount, any piece of gold or silver that can, we could ever even think of. This inheritance that God has promised us is an eternal inheritance uh, as adoption, as His children. Uh, to spend eternity with Him in heaven. And that's, a, that's an amazing thought and something, that, again, that is more valuable than any uh, gold or silver or, or dollar uh, that, that's on this planet. But again, it was according to, to God's intention. It was according to, to His will. So God has given us an inheritance. But He also says, also, that it was in Christ. Verse 12, He says, to the hope that we were in Christ. And verse 11, in whom also we have obtained this inheritance. God's eternal blessings can only be obtained by those who are in Christ. The fourth and final action that God has taken regarding our adoptions is that he has sealed us. Look at verse 13, he says, in whom you also, after listening to the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed... You were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who has given us a pledge of our inheritance into the redemption of possession to the praise of His glory. You were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. This word sealed, again, this is something that the, the Ephesians would have been very familiar with. Uh, it would have been, uh, I don't know how much history you guys like or how much movies you guys uh, you know like but personally I'm a history guy I love history and I love watching movies that take place in medieval times and the, and the you know the middle ages and so on and so forth and biblical times in fact there's a new movie coming out that uh, that we were looking at uh, during the, the Roman era um, but it's there in these movies uh, we see examples of this. Uh, this. This idea of a seal is something that was used in these times um, often. And it, it's really had to do with like a, a king. When they would send a letter to, to a recipient, they would take this letter, this scroll, you know, and they would put wax on it, and then they, they would seal it with a signet ring. They would heat up the wax, and then they would stamp their signet ring on the wax, and they would put their seal on that scroll. And it showed two things. One, it showed authority, and two, it showed uh, really possession. So it, it, when this, this scroll showed up to whoever it was supposed to be sent to, uh, and it had this, this stamp, this seal on it, it would show that, one, this is from, who it says it is, from the king, and two, it would show that it belongs to the king. And so if that seal was broken, then there were going to be issues, right? The, the, the king was going to, to have, have an issue with whoever sent that letter, and somebody, unfortunately, might, uh, might have to pay a serious uh, price for, for messing up that, that letter. But again, it brought to that recipient uh, comfort, knowing, hey, this is from the king, and it belongs to him. Well, the same is true with this seal that we've been given. We've been given the seal of the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, so this seal shows, one, that, that God is the one who is in authority. Again, all these things have been according to God's purpose, according to God's plan. And it also shows uh, possession. Verse 14 says that uh, in this, this seal, this Holy Spirit of promise, is given as a pledge of our inheritance into the redemption of possession, to the praise of His glory. So as children, we belong to God. This Holy Spirit 
that we've been given as a seal shows that we belong to God. It is it's a down payment, if you will. It says, uh, the NAS translates in verse 14, that it's given as a pledge of our inheritance. This pledge, this word, means literally like a deposit or a down payment. Uh, so we really, when, when we die, this, this is really what we have as our, our down payment. is the Holy Spirit of promise, this seal that we've been given. So again, God has redeemed us. He's made known to us the mystery. He's given us an inheritance. And He sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's worth noting too, though, that again, in verse 14, He says, to the praise of His glory. Verse 12, to the praise of His glory. Verse 6, into the praise of His glory. So three times in this doxology, Paul says that it's to the praise of His glory, meaning God's glory. God takes pleasure in us choosing Him. Yesterday we were speaking with Quentin, and Quentin mentioned that how really the purpose of God's creating man is, is for His glory. It's for us to choose Him. Verse 12, Paul says that to the end that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, would be to the praise of His glory. When we choose to choose Christ and put on Christ and to be baptized into Christ, it, it pleases God. It's to the praise of His glory. God's eternal blessings can only be obtained by those who are in Christ. The onset of this lesson, we, we spoke about uh, Leonardo Esteban, who who again was adopted by, by an American family and has li lived the last 16 years in the United States. I said that, that he was lucky, uh, you know, he didn't have to, to live the life of, of servanthood as his brothers and sisters did. And in fact, I, I'm, I'm well familiar with, with Leonardo because he's my brother. My parents flew down to Guatemala 16 years ago and adopted, now, Gabriel Leonardo James Lester into our family. Gabriel has experienced just every bit as much love and comfort and the, and the luxuries of being a part of our family just as much as I or my sister have. I love my brother, again, just no different than if he was my, my, my blood brother. Um, you guys will, Lord willing, be able to meet him here in, in a couple months. Uh, again, he was adopted into our family, but he's experienced all the benefits of being in our family. I would lay down my life for my adopted brother. He is, again, he is my brother. And there's no, no shortage of love, you know, that, that exists just because he was adopted. And if that's true... For us, as people, as humans, how much more true do you think it is that God loves us, the creator of us? God created us all. Again, he says that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, in love, having predetermined us into adoption as sons through Jesus Christ into himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. God loves each and every one of us. He wants us all to be adopted as sons. He wants us to be His children. But again, these eternal blessings that He's promising, this eternal adoption that He's promised, can only be obtained by those who are in Christ. In these 11 verses in this doxology, Paul mentions in Him or in Christ or in whom 10 times. 10 times in 11 verses he mentions in Him or in whom or in Christ. All these things that God has promised us and given us can only be obtained by those who are in Christ. In chapter 3 of, of the same letter here, Paul speaks about you know one faith and one baptism. In fact, he gives seven ones, if you will. But he speaks about this one baptism. Scripture tells us that that is how we get in Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27 says that, For we are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. It says, For as many of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have clothed ourselves with Christ. See, baptism is how we get into Christ. 
the application for us today is, is that we have to remember that God's eternal blessings, this adoption can only come in Christ. And we, we have to remember too that this inheritance that we've been promised, this seal, is something that uh, we must remain faithful with or else we can lose this, this inheritance. Um, you know, we, we've been written in the will, so to speak, by giving us the Holy Spirit of promise that we receive upon our baptism. But if we don't continue to live faithfully, it is something that, that we can lose. And we must, and we there is no other option. God's eternal blessings can only be obtained by those who are in Christ. Now, I don't know if there's anybody here today who has not uh, been baptized into Christ, who has not received that, that Holy Spirit, that seal uh, of promise to obtain that inheritance. But if there's not, then... The time is now. The invitation will be extended in just a moment, but that invitation is open each and every day, each and every moment, every day. God is longing for your adoption. He wants to adopt you as his child. But perhaps you, you have been adopted. Perhaps you have been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and received that, that Holy Spirit, that seal. But maybe you you straight away, maybe you've forgotten that. Maybe you've lived in a manner to where you think that uh, you need forgiveness of, of your sins. Uh, we would ask that you would come forward as we stand and we sing this song here in just a second. And the brethren here will pray for you. Uh, we're here for one another. That's what we are as Christ's family. Again, we are all God's children. And we are all, we've all been adopted uh, into his family through Christ and through being baptized uh, into his name. So we would ask that you would come forward as we stand and as we sing.